Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick with the Associated Press. I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while working to foster a free press around the world. For more information about the National Press Club, we'd invite you to look at our website. That's at www.press.org. And to donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library, you can look at the website there. That's part of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker, as well as all of those of you who are attending today's event here in the ballroom. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, this is my reminder during this political season for each and every luncheon that we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity when you hear that applause. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available for free download on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag Pound NPC Lunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A as we always do, and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. And now it's time to introduce our head table. Please note that a journalist's presence at the head table uh, does not imply or signify an endorsement of any speaker. Uh, I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. And we'll begin from your right, Noel St. John. He's a freelance photojournalist and coordinator of our member volunteer photographers here at the club. Thank you for all that, Noel. Matt Small, he's one of my colleagues at Associated Press Radio, a radio producer there. We know him as the Beast. It's good to have him here at the head table. Myron Belkind is an adjunct professor at the George Washington School of Media and Public Affairs and our NPC treasurer. April Ryan is Washington Bureau Chief and White House Correspondent with American Urban Radio Network. Andy Sporkin is a Vice President for Communications with the Association of American Publishers and a guest of our speaker. Nice to have you here today, Andy. Skip over the podium for just a moment. Melissa Charbonneau with Newshook Media, our Speakers Committee Chair. This may be her last luncheon here today, and we're so thankful for all the wonderful work that you've done here this year. We'll skip over the speaker for just a moment. Alicia Mundy is with the Wall Street Journal, and she's a member of the Speakers Committee and a co-organizer of today's event. Thank you for all of that. Jim Paratori is executive producer with TMZ.com and a guest of the speaker. Nice to have you here today as well, Jim. Richard Simon is a reporter with the Los Angeles Times. Rick Dunham, this is a long list of titles here. He's a former NPC president. He is the Washington bureau chief with the Houston Chronicle and Hearst. And he is also the president of our National Press Club Journalism Institute, of which the Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library is the crown jewel. <laughs> Garrett Graff is a new member of the club. He is editor of the Washingtonian Magazine. Garrett, nice to have you here, and thank you for your membership. And at the end of the table, Christopher Chambers is professional professor of journalism at Georgetown University, an all-round good guy. Good to have you here as well. Please give them a round of applause. Well, those of us who are in the trade know that no good reporter, and maybe even some bad ones, no good reporter likes to be scooped. We really don't like it when we're beaten by an internet site that focuses on the both at once glittery and grimy entertainment industry. But in the summer of 2009, a lot of people were beaten on the story, in fact everybody was, a story about the death of pop idol Michael Jackson. As we all know, the aftermath of that story continues to unfold in a California courtroom where Jackson's doctor is being tried for involuntary manslaughter. TMZ's stock was celebrity gossip, but its founder, Harvey Levin, knew that the Michael Jackson story, like so many other events in the entertainment world, had become part of our nation's culture as well as a reflection of it. That success of his venture is proof that Americans want their Lindsay Lohan and J-Lo fixes as well. Our guests figured out a better way to deliver that. TMZ.com was launched in 2005 and within seven months became the number one entertainment news site in the world. In 2007, Newsweek called TMZ the breakout blog. And the New York Times is called Harvey, the man who may represent the future of celebrity journalism. TMZ claims to be the first operation to have broken such celebrity stories as Mel Gibson's wild anti-Semitic tirade after his DUI arrest, 
the John Edwards sex scandal, which of course had uh, huge repercussions throughout the world of politics, and the details of Tiger Woods' downfall that began with the seemingly minor auto accident on Thanksgiving. TMZ said the initial public account of Tiger's run-in with a neighbor's tree didn't make any sense, and they were right. <laughs> By the time it was all over, the golf legend was divorced from his wife and from many of his sponsors, and he's no longer the world's number one golfer. These kinds of events transcend celebrity gossip. They flow into business and political issues. TMZ has grown from a celebrity video-centric website to a live web stream program, a TV show that's syndicated daily by Fox Broadcasting, and as of this summer, a radio program on satellite radio. TMZ has played, uh, rather has broken ground in the way that news is packaged with an emphasis on speed. Last year, a study by the New York Times named TMZ the 10th most popular news site, measured by Google News and Google Blog Hits. And according to Alexa, the website rankings concern, TMZ ranks above CBSNews.com, Bloomberg.com, Politico, and NPR. Our guest has had a fascinating journey which continues to unfold, and we're thankful that it brought him here today. He graduated from the University of Chicago Law School and was a litigator at a major legal firm in L.A., but he also was a working journalist in the trenches. He spent more than a decade as an investigative reporter for KCBS in Los Angeles and covered many high-profile court cases for stations around the country. He received nine Emmy Awards for his reporting and was a columnist at the L.A. Times and a radio talk show host. He created and produced the syndicated series Celebrity Justice and helped bring us TV shows like The People's Court and Moral Court. He has come here today to talk about the TMZ empire, why TMZ and TMZ wannabes are so successful, and what it means for the future of journalism. The issues that we're going to discuss today could not be more timely. Journalism enterprises of all kinds are trying to get a handle on the question, what is the right model in, in the digital age? And our guest speaker today appears to have hit on something, to say the least. So we're pleased that he has accepted our invitation to speak. We've had a number of top-flight journalist guests at our podium this year alone, including Ariana Huffington and Juan Williams at Fox, as well as his since-fired boss at NPR, Vivian Schiller. Tom Brokaw will be here in just a few days. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to Mr. Harvey Levin. I bet Tom Brokaw is not going to talk about Lindsay Lohan at the morgue, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm going to change up what I planned on talking to you about because something happened this morning that was pretty interesting. Um, I spoke to students at George Washington uh, University in media, and what I noticed was they were, they looked depressed. They really looked depressed. And when they started speaking, I realized, you know, they felt that the job market was bleak, their future was uncertain, um, they didn't really have a vision for the future, um, and they were scared. And it really kind of shocked me um, because it sounded to me like they were learning about problems without learning about solutions and not learning about how you can take an industry in trouble and carve out a niche that will make you successful and make the industry more healthy. Um, so the overlay to all of this is they told me, and you always love hearing this just before you go on, that there was a debate on whether they would invite me there among the professors there. Um, because they thought, you know, TMZ covers celebrity journalism and that really doesn't rise to the standard of, um, of what you folks should be learning. And with all due respect, that does kind of relate to what I wanted to talk to you folks about. Because I think that there was a big disconnect today when I, when I had this, this little talk with the students. Because I think that what some of the professors were missing, and I think what is so important is that it's not the subject matter that's covered that is really important. It's how it's covered. You know, we are a news operation. 
that uses the same skills, the same standards that I used as a working journalist at various news operations. We are extremely aggressive, but we figured out a way of doing it where I think um, the operation is relevant to what's going on today. And that, to me, is what's important. I, I don't so much want to talk about celebrity news. I want to talk about the delivery system, because that's what's relevant. That's what's important. And I do think that the delivery system in media generally right now is stale. And I think that there is a good chance that a lot of people here will be put out of work if the people who run this delivery system don't change it and don't change it quickly. But I think it can be changed. That's what I want to spend a little time talking about before we open it up for questions. There have been radical changes in the last 30 years, really let's talk 10, in the last 10 years, radical changes in technology, in consumer taste. And I don't think that has been reflected in the media, period. If you look at broadcast journalism, there is a kind of uh, a standard way of presenting news, which has been going on for four decades, that you have a, an anchor throwing to a reporter, who usually repeats part of what the anchor said, who then throws to a package that has very predictably some track, some sound, some track, some sound, some track, some sound, and then the reporter comes back, says goodbye, the anchor says thank you, and you move on to the next. And that's the way it's been done for 40 years. And it can be done better. And then the question, why hasn't it? And I, I think that people get so rooted in what they've done when they have some success that they think we need to hold on to the success rather than to um, evolve with what's going on technologically, evolve with what's going on in terms of consumer taste. I was watching, and, I, and again, I'm just going to use this as an example because um, <laughs> I'm, my, my head is sometimes all over the place, so I like to talk about the last thing that I saw. But I was, when I was getting ready this morning, I was watching very early um, CNN. They had a show called um, CNN Student News. And I looked and I thought, okay, well, they're trying to attract a younger audience. And they had a guy there who was young, and he wasn't wearing a coat, he was wearing a sweater vest. But everything else was the same. He was looking into the camera, he was reading copy, he was talking about the same stories that everybody else was talking about. And you know, I, in, in my head, I don't know why this popped in, it reminded me of John JonBenet Ramsey, that it, was, that it was like dressing up this kid to be something that the news director wants him to be when that's not authentically who he is. And that's not the way he should have been presented. That if you're really trying to attract young people, do it in the voice of young people. Do it with a different delivery. But it was exactly the same thing, but it got, the guy was wearing a sweater rather than a coat. It doesn't cut it. The fact is, young people aren't interested in traditional media for the most part anymore because it doesn't speak to them. And it's getting, the, the audience is getting older and older. So when young people aren't coming and the old people are getting older, you know what happens in the end. I mean, it, it's, it's inevitable. So when you, when you look at what happens with the dynamics of the audience, then the question is, what are people doing to attract those young people, to regenerate interest in, in what's really important, which is the news. And when I say the news, it can be politics, it can be um, city government, it can be celebrity, but what do you do to attract those people? And then the question is, how do you reinvent yourself? And that brings me to newspapers and magazines. That, you know, you look at newspapers and magazines, which have had a, a storied run for a hundred years and have served a useful function, but 
you know, when newspapers started, when magazines started, there was no such thing as video. And there was no such thing as a photo gallery. And technologically, there are so many things that have evolved. There are so many ways people can get their news. What is the magic of holding a piece of paper up in the air when you read? I mean, what is, what is it that drives professors and others to, you know, s sing the praises of newspapers still when it's not the future? And I know that sounds harsh, but that doesn't mean that newspapers have to fold. It means they have to reinvent themselves and reinvent themselves perhaps online, but not in a way that's being done now in many cases. Right now what's happening is that online, the, you know, a newspaper can be on two platforms now, online and the paper, and they compete with each other. They're not complementary. You know, do you break the story in the newspaper? Do you break the story online? And uh, there, are like lot, there are lots of struggles going on within um, newspaper organizations right now on how to do this. But at a point, you have to choose. And yet, there's something about newspapers, this holy grail that people talk about, that we just have to preserve this. Why? Why? What is it about paper? It's not even politically correct anymore. What is it about paper that, that makes us so rooted in the past? And, and, and what is it that, that forces people to shut down when they talk about how to evolve it into what's going on today? Um, what I've noticed is that there has been a resistance to going on to the web because people say it's just too fast. That if you go on to the web, then um, there's not enough time to vet, and you're going to be inaccurate, and there's going to be a rush to publish. That's a cop-out. I mean, to say we're not going to evolve this way because we're afraid we're going to be inaccurate is just a cop-out. The web doesn't force you to publish before you're ready to publish. It gives you the technology, the devices to do it when you're ready. You still set the standards. You still decide when to pull the trigger. It's your decision. The web is an enabler. It doesn't force you to do what you don't want to do. So again, this kind of, and, and, and I always get this, that the web is bad because it's too urgent. Cable news has been around 24 hours for what, three decades? So it's not like 24 hours is anything new. But there are these devices now that let you recreate and let you recast in a way that can make everybody more relevant, um, more timely, and yet it's, I think it's met with some resistance still. You know, when we publish, I'll tell you, there are stories we publish that we, can, we publish in minutes when we get them. And then there are stories that take a lot longer. We published a story today, interesting story, about NBC, um, that um, they are kind of secretly trying to get the Casey Anthony interview. Um, and the way they're doing it is they have a producer that has made contact with literary agents trying to score a book deal for Casey Anthony, trying to get her front end money. And the representation is if we get a book deal for Casey Anthony, we will get a one hour primetime special on NBC. And this producer is quietly shopping this around. Well, we had this story we, we got the tip on this story last Tuesday, and we published it this morning. And I wanted to get Jose Baez on the record, number one, because I knew he knew about it, and we didn't accomplish that until yesterday. So um, it felt like it was worth the wait to make sure we got that. So that took six days to get that story, and it's an important story, and it's a good story. But again, it took six days, and then again, there are things we get that we publish immediately. When Michael Jackson died, I mean, you know, we didn't publish that story until we were 100% sure. And then we waited a little longer still. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't force you to do what you don't want to do. And I think that's just a really important point. Um, you know, and, and, and I do want to mention one other story, the Mel Gibson DUI story. Um, you know, a lot of people say, for, you know, for what we do, you know, this is, it's still just covering, you know, celebrities. 
You know, for better or worse, celebrities are important in our culture, um, and people are interested in that. And I, I, and I do think that the kind of disdain that some people have for covering it um, kind of reflects a disconnect with the taste of the American public. You may not like it that people are interested, but they are. And when you look at what we give people in journalism, to me, it's not the front page of the New York Times. It's more like a magazine, that people are interested in all sorts of things. I mean, look, I cover, you know, celebrity journalism. And, you know, my favorite thing to read is books on Abraham Lincoln. You know, I'm not a one-dimensional guy, and I don't think many people are that one-dimensional that they only like one thing. And I think that there's a diet out there where people can be intensely interested in all sorts of things, and that it serves a function that people want. And that's what I care about right now. I mean, I'm really looking at my audience when we, um, in our business model, I look at what my audience wants, not what I want. I mean, look, I'm way older than my, my target demo. And it's one of the reasons I like having young people in my office. I listen to them. It's very egalitarian in that sense, that I can't pretend to know. And, you know, it's not this kind of top-down where the people at the top give these edicts. You cover this, you cover that. We have a very open office in a bullpen where everybody throws out ideas. And I couldn't possibly tell you about urban music. I couldn't possibly tell you about sports the way other people in my office can tell you about sports, and we cover all of this. And, you know, I think to open yourself up and to understand taste is so critical to staying relevant and as, as important as technology. And I think that people need to open themselves up to that more. And rather than have disdain for it, there's got to be some acceptance because ultimately, we're in business. We're all in business. And if we don't run our business well, um, we don't survive well. And so I think there's got to be a balance there, but I think there's got to, you've got to pay some homage to the fact that it is a business. Um, two other things I want to talk about. One is, you know, we've spent a lot of time obviously working on the web, um, you know, when, and, and the television show, but to me, this will all change within five years. And in five years, this is going to be a radically different business. And I don't think the web is going to look the way it looks. I don't think television is going to look the way it looks. I think there's going to be a merger of the two. I know there's going to be a merger of the two. And it will have qualities of both, but will look like neither. And that's where my head is right now. That, I mean, I, you know, just as I'm saying, I think that the delivery system has gotten stale generally in traditional media. I don't want to fall victim to that. And, and I think that, you know, at least my effort has, is being spent on that blend. And we're experimenting with something we call TMZ Live every, that we run every day on the website and on the radio. And it's kind of trying to blend those two elements. But I, it's just another example of how everything changes. And to stay relevant, to, to, to capture an audience and to keep an audience and to grow an audience that if you get some measure of success, you can't say, how do I hold that success? Because everybody in this room has had it. Then the question is, what do you do with it? Do you grow it, or do you try to maintain it? And I think we're in a business, and I think we're in a, tech, in a technological world where you can't maintain. You just cannot maintain. You, you grow or you die. And, and, and I think that is the reality. And I think, you know, what I told these students was, you know, you all look so depressed. And rather than looking at this as, oh my God, it's going to be so hard to get a job, there are a lot of people running these, you know, studios and, and networks and, and, you know, magazines and newspapers that are looking for the, for the answers. They don't know. And if you have an answer, if you've got the sensibility of somebody young to attract a young audience, they will listen to you. And this is an opportunity for you. This is a revolution right now. This is an opportunity to quickly make your mark. And don't be depressed. Think about a vision for what you want to do. Don't just plug into what exists. But you've got to think about that. And, I, and I'll tell you, we've had a measure of success, 
but I'm always looking for those people to come and say, hey, you're doing this wrong, you could be doing this better, because every day I walk into my office, I walk in scared. And I mean that. I am scared every morning when I walk into the office. I have this feeling in my stomach. Are we going to get the right stories? Are we going to produce this well enough? What's happening to the business? I mean, there are just a million questions. I run scared. I do. But I don't run scared looking at others. I run scared myself. And, you know, I don't know whether that works for other people. It actually works for me because it's genuine. Um, and I don't think. I can never rest on what we've achieved just in terms of audience and, 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 and whatnot. Because um, I know that if we don't keep looking ahead, um, that what I said at the beginning will be about us. And I don't want that to happen. So I am more than happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for that speech while we transition here? Thank you for that inspiring speech. And I, you know, I have to say, first of all, about the young people piece, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I had an opportunity, I wrote about this on my blog just recently here on the Press Club a website, that the young journalists uh, out there, and indeed perhaps the ones that aren't so young, all have a tremendous opportunity in this transition. And it is unfortunate that so many people seem to only see the negative, and obviously your enterprise has been a beneficiary of that change. And there are positive things to be uh, mined in this environment. Let's talk a little bit about the entertainment industry and, and some of the, the special things that you do. And we'll just have a sort of informal Q&A. And we've had some kind questions passed up from our audience. Let me ask you, in terms of the market that you're serving, and that can be defined any number of different ways, but obviously entertainment news is, is the heart of that. Are we now in a culture where entertainment news is more popular than ever before? Uh, how do you assess the market for entertainment news at this point in our history, in our culture? I think it has, I think there's been a real interest in it in the last five or six years, but for a reason. Um, when you look at traditional media and the way they covered Hollywood, um, the media didn't choose stories. The publicists chose stories. That the traditional media was always based on getting interviews with stars. And publicists were smart enough to say, we can leverage this. And we can dictate what traditional media do, in, in entertainment does and what they don't do. So they would go to shows to magazines and say, look, you want so-and-so? Do this story. And it didn't matter if the story was true or not. They would do the story because they wanted the person. And conversely, if the publicist knew that a show had gotten wind of a story that the publicist didn't want out, the publicist would call and say, you do that story and you will never get any of my clients. And it worked. And it worked for years, it worked for decades. And everything was false that was coming out. But everybody played the game. Nobody broke rank. You know, if we did anything fundamentally different when we created TMZ, it was that we decided we weren't going to do any interviews with stars. And the reason is we wanted to change the balance of power. And we called all of the publicists and said, look, this game about do this, don't do that, we're not going to play the game. We're going to do honest stories. And we will be fair, we will be honest, and we will be accurate. And we want to work with you. But you can't tell us what to do and what not to do. Some jumped on board, others didn't. It took time. They're all on board now. I mean, they realized that they had to change. What it's done now is, our I think the stories in the last five years have become more authentic. And people are saying, Oh my God, this is totally different than this kind of managed, phony, you know, celebrity uh, machine. And I think when they've seen the, the you know, the, the, the true Hollywood, the good and the bad, it's become more interesting to them. And I think that's why there's this kind of spike in the interest in journalism, because it was all the same, it was all ho-hum, there was a sense that it wasn't real, and I think that's been blown up some now, 
And I think it's just more authentic. And, you know, I, I compared it this morning. Somebody asked me the same thing. That it's like in Russia when everybody had gray coats. And then all of a sudden, the gap came in. And you could have a red coat, and you could have a blue coat, and you could have a green coat. And it's the same thing, that this opened up this whole um, rainbow that I don't think existed before. And I think that the audience has responded. But there still is a lot of the old way of doing business being done, correct? I mean, you see some of the products that are out there, and I'm talking about news products, and it's all about how the next thing from this celebrity is going to be the best version of that product ever, and of course, five days from then, we'll never remember that product again. There's still a lot of that out there, Absolutely. Right? I mean, absolutely. There's, it, it, it's not like everybody has... What's, what I think has happened, though, is that some of the traditional um, entertainment media have become schizophrenic that what they'll do is they realize they have to be more real so they'll do some of those stories and then they'll go back to being you know these uh, you know uh, supplicants and they'll and they, and they go back and, they, and and suddenly the problem with that is then they lose their identity it's like who are they and you know sudden they're, they're doing they're, they're doing both ends of the spectrum and they're whipsawing the audience and I don't I think they're kind of losing their brand as one who's an attorney, and obviously has been watching this space for a long time, it just now occurs to me, why isn't there more transparency in the reporting of entertainment news to the extent that, you know, Washington Post has an ombudsman, NPR has an ombudsman, why isn't there anybody really highlighting some of these transactions that continue to go on out there? Such as? Well, uh, you know, very favorable coverage just because you get access to the celebrity, right? So in other words, the, 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 the emphasis of the piece is this, this product is coming down the pike and, and it's, the emphasis is entirely on the product when if you're really going to write a story, that probably really isn't what the news piece is, right? I mean, for me, the more interesting stories are what we did today with NBC and Casey Anthony because it's kind of going through the back door where you can't go in the front. And that to me is a lack of transparency and that's a really interesting story for me. The, you know, doing stories about, gee, that's kind of phony, the reason I'm not that interested is I don't think the audience connects to that stuff anymore either. I think that there are people doing those stories, I think you're right, but I don't think the audience cares. I think they see through it. That when they started to see, hey, these are the real stories, the way they're presented are real, they're, they're authentic, um, I think that I, th I think the other stories feel false, so it doesn't, they don't matter as much as the organizations that push them think they matter. Mm -hmm. So you earlier uh, talked about how you like Lincoln and you like the other uh, part. Uh, do you worry that our culture focuses too much on this uh, material overall? It's a great market for you to be serving, obviously a successful enterprise, et cetera, and, and you're giving the audience what it wants. But do you worry that in the marketplace, sometimes we're missing the big picture? I remember before 9-11, you couldn't help watch an hour's worth of coverage about Gary Condit on CNN, and then, you know, things change for the worse that fall in a big way. And I just sometimes wonder that as, as a culture and as a country, asking the question, whether, you know, as a nation and as a people, we sometimes have our eyes on the wrong thing. I think we do have our eyes on the wrong thing a lot, but I don't think it's limited to celebrity. You know, I think about Monica Lewinsky. Um, that I mean, I don't think about her, but <laughs> but but um, you know, my recollection is that all three anchors at the time, Peter Jennings, Dan Rather, and Tom Brokaw, were in Cuba covering the Pope when this story broke. And when they found out what she did to him in the Oval Office, they were on the first jet that smoked out of Cuba. And it was, and, and, and the Cuban um, Pope visit, papal visit was historic. And I mean, nobody can tell me that the amount of coverage about Monica Lewinsky was not directly tied to cigars and dresses and all of that, that it was not tied to a constitutional crisis. I know what it was about. They know what it was about. They wrapped it in the constitutional paper, but it wasn't about that at all. So, I mean, I think everybody's guilty of it, but I think to say it's, a, it's, it's endemic to celebrity, it's not. Okay. So what kind of stories work best for you? And obviously you've, you've been very good at breaking certain kinds of stories. What are the, what are the stories that you really like to have in your space? And 
the other part of that is what will you not touch? In other words, it, whether it's a video confrontation, uh, it's a factoid, what it, what's fair game, what's great, and what's hands off? I like balance. Um, what I do all day long on the website, um, the TV show is different. I mean, the TV show is a, really a comedic take on Hollywood. Um, it serves a very different function than the web. But uh, the, the website, you know, we have 13 stories on the homepage. I'm looking all day long at whether we have balance. I want something important to anchor the site, something in really interesting that grabs people. I want photos. I want a video. I want something light. I want something um, ironic. Um, I want that balance on the page. So it's not any one thing I want. I always want that balance. I mean, what we've tried to do, and I think pretty successfully, um, half our audience is men, it's, it's split almost evenly between men and women on both the TV show and the web, which is unheard of in celebrity. And we try and give people enough that there's that general interest. And I think that's, that's what's really important to me. So it's not any one thing. As for what we won't do, um, we reject stories all day long, all day long. And um, we will reject things that we know other people will do. Um, you know the Michael Phelps bong story, you know, when he was smoking the bong? We had that three months before it broke, and it felt wrong to me. I mean, it felt like he was set up, um, that, that um, the circumstances just felt wrong. And I put the picture up in my office for three months, and I knew it was going to eventually break. But just to show people, there's, you know, these are the things we won't do. Um, I remember not too long ago, um, you know, we covered the courts. We are aggressive in the courts. And we got these documents in the Britney Spears case um, in her conservatorship. And there were these, there was this information in there. It was really personal and I think hurtful to her children. And I looked at this and, and, and the person down at the courts who we, ha who we have called me up and said what, what she had and I said, this is a mistake. I mean, they never, clearly never meant to have this thing public. It should have been sealed. And, and it was just hurtful and it would have hurt these kids. And I mean, look, I mean, I'm, a, I'm not saying we're these, you know, this Florence Nightingale. I mean, we're, we're aggressive reporters, but that felt wrong. And I called up her lawyer and I just said, you couldn't have meant for this to be public. And she freaked out and said, oh my God, this is a mistake. She called the judge. Instantly, the judge sealed it, but we had the only copy. And the copy we had was legitimate. I mean, it was a real public document, and we never published it. Um, so all day long, we have debates all day long in the newsroom about what to put up, of what to put up on the site, what not to put up, and we really encourage it. Lots of debates. It's, it's a big bullpen, and we want everybody participating because, you know, we, you also learn who's coming up, you know, young people who are PAs can eventually become producers, so you want these voices. And we debate all day long about what to put up and not. And obviously, you know, at a point when you, when you become a, a big operation, lots of people send you lots of things and tips. And this is a constant thing in the office. So I had a number of people either ask me sort of in person before we came here, we had some cards sent up. What are the ground rules regarding paying for content or not? And just talk generally about how your process works in the sense of you said you had a staff of a little more than 100 people, which you characterized as perhaps being uh, rather uh, sparse given the amount of output you have. Talk about the staff, the ground rules, pay for play, all that kind of thing. Sure. Um, I will gladly buy video from anybody in this room who has some good video. <laughs> um, I have absolutely no problem with that. Um, and I have no problem buying photos. Um, and, you know, it's funny because people talk about this and say, well, gee, you, you pay for things. Well, yeah, we pay for video and photos. Absolutely. Why not? Um, you have to think about what's the logic behind either paying for it or not paying for it. Um, if I buy a video, it doesn't change the video. It's objective. The video is the video. And if somebody shoots it and I'm in a business and somebody comes to me and says, would you like this for your business? Um, we want we want to charge you something, and I look at it, and there's value in it. I'll buy it. Um, and I will say, it's no different from um, I'm sure a lot of people here worked in local news at one point. Um, you know, when there's a fire um, in a house in the middle of the night or a crash in the freeway, they have stringers that are out there 
all night long, shooting all these things. And these stringers then go to the news stations in the morning and say, we got a video of this crash, we got a video of this fire, you want to buy it? Same thing. It's exactly the same thing. It's been going on forever, and I have no problem with it and will absolutely buy photos and video. Interviews are different. Number one, we don't really we don't do interviews. But the problem with paying for interviews is it's not objective. And that when you offer somebody money for an interview, you are basically saying to them, wow, you're going to pay me that much money? I better make this a really good story. And you're, you're incentivizing the person to shade the truth, to even lie, to make it worth their while. If they know that their story is going to be worth X if they tell the right story, or three times X if they embellish, well, they're going for the money. And you don't know that they're not telling the truth. And that's the problem with paying for interviews. Now, what's happened with a lot of traditional media is they've figured out, they think they figured out a way, or they thought they did, of getting around that, which is we're not going to pay for the interview. We'll just pay Joe Jackson $100,000 for a high school yearbook picture of Michael Jackson. They're not paying for the interview, right. So, you know, that's the way they got around it for a long time. We did a story. We found out that all of the networks were courting Jose Baez to get the Casey Anthony interview and that Jose Baez was down in the bar at the Mandarin Oriental talking to Mark Garagos about how much money this was worth. And we did a story about all of this, and this was about three months ago. And uh, two days after we did the story, ABC News came out, which was really interesting, and said, we will no longer pay for um, photos and video um, connected to an interview, which I thought was kind of an interesting, revealing statement. But it was that kind of backdoor way of doing it which I think is the real problem. But video, anything objective, absolutely. And in terms of the staff, you know, it's like any other staff. I mean, we have, you know, aggressive journalists and we have managers and, you know, it's, it, a lot of my staff has been trained from the ground up. And um, that was never the intention. I mean, we always thought we'd get a mix. It's been more training staff from the ground up. And it's worked for us because they have the sensibility, they understand the sensibility of who we are, wh where we go, what the brand is. You know, they need to be managed, but we have really good managers. And so let's say I'm a member of a law enforcement uh, team and I've got a fact out there that I think you guys would really like to run, but I'm going to say, you know what, it's going to cost you $5,000. You won't do that. No, you can't. But I will say we have n numerous law enforcement contacts, numerous law enforcement contacts that, I mean, look, I, I was a reporter for many, many, many years in L.A., and much of this happens in L.A., and when I was a reporter in L.A., I developed a lot of sources in, you know, police departments, lawyers, judges, all sorts of people, um, and those people just didn't evaporate. Um, at the same time, I have a staff that has been remarkable and that they have a work ethic and they have created their own niches where they have found their own sources. And, you know, my, my operation is very egalitarian. Um, when we have morning meetings, everybody's in the morning meeting. I, and when we did the Mel Gibson story, the DUI story, the person who first found out about the DUI was a PA who had a friend who was a waiter at Moon Shadows who saw the red lights after Mel Gibson walked out. And had I not made him feel included in the process, we would never would have broken the original story. So um, this is a very egalitarian thing, and everybody has kind of developed their own context. It's a very Kevin Bacon-like city, that somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. And we have a lot of sources, and they trust us. And what I tell my staff is that that is, that that is the word that is the difference between success and failure. If people trust you, and if they think you're going to be fair with them, they will come back. And if they don't trust you, if you do something where they say, I, you've done something that makes me not trust you anymore, it will damage us gravely. And trust is the biggest thing. And we have lots and lots of those sources. Briefly, you just gave us a little of the DNA of the Mel Gibson story. Briefly, what's the DNA of how you broke the Michael Jackson down? Um, trying to think of how much to say. Um, part of that was we made a phone call. Um, the biggest part of the Michael Jackson story was not when we found out he was dead. Um, that had the biggest splash, obviously. But for us, in terms of 
chasing the story. The initial story we had was an ambulance went to his house and, you know, he had doctors all the time. I mean, we knew that. Um, and when he died, you know, that was a huge thing. But the biggest story that changed it for us, that made us understand the urgency, was we found out that he was in full cardiac arrest. And we found that out. I, I'm not going to say how, but we made a certain phone call that anybody could have made, that anybody could have made. And um, we found out that information. And that changed everything. And from there, we started working our sources because we knew early on how desperate it was. And that was, a, again, a call that lots and lots of people could have made. But it changed everything. Somebody asked, what is the most ridiculous or hilarious video or picture of a celebrity that you have published? Uh, if you want to say the one you didn't publish, that would be fine. Too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Any come to mind? God, you know, it's one of those things where every day things happen. I, you know, it's like, m honestly, for me, it's like, it's like a bathtub. It's bath. I call it bathtub knowledge. That the tub fills up with water every day, and then you pull the plug, and then you fill it up again the next day. And then I can't remember um, from one to the next because it all kind of blends together. Um, Let me rephrase the question I, another way. Then anything that you actually ran along those lines and then regretted, said, you know what? Maybe we'd have been better off. Yeah. Doing. Okay. I'll give you. Well, but this wasn't a shocking photo. It was just the way we dealt with it. And I think this was, you know, um, I, my staff is really creative. <laughs> and um, they push the envelope sometimes with the non-important stories. And sometimes they can become, if, you, if they're not managed right, they can become big stories themselves. Um, Jennifer Love Hewitt at one point had gained some weight. And there was a photograph of her that clearly showed that. And somebody on my staff who was a very clever guy, and I will blame this on myself um, because it just didn't register. On, it just didn't. But um, he wrote a story on it. It was two sentences. But the headline, you know, I, for those of you who are familiar with her movies, this will be, you will get it. And for those of you who aren't familiar, this will just seem mean. Um, the headline was, I know what you ate last summer. <laughs> and, and, you know, we were severely criticized for that, and rightly so, um, and rightly so. And it became, and literally, I mean, People Magazine ended up doing this big cover story on Jennifer Love Hewitt and on weight and, 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 and all of this afterwards. But, um, yeah, I mean, That's a good example. I regret it. Very good. <laughs> So you talked earlier about how a lot of people don't get what they need to be doing in the business. But as you look out there, what do you see where they do get it? New enterprises doing, or old enterprises doing something new or right? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that people have this sense that um, the internet is a huge player. It's how to harness it and what to do with it. And, you know, I mean, I, listen, I, I, there are lots of, I, I read Politico all the time. I think they're doing a really good job. I think there are others that are doing a really good job. The New York Times has figured out, I think, um, the web better than most. The LA Times has a, a, a good website where it's somewhat complimentary, although there are still issues there. Um, to me, you know, I think people are struggling on the internet, and I think that's good, that they need to figure that out. TV is more problematic. I think that, you know, the problem with TV is I don't think people realize how broken the delivery system is. And that, you know, Jim, uh, Jim and I were talking last night, and you don't need the middleman as much anymore. And I mean, I, that may sound a little bit threatening, but the notion of anchors and reporters who kind of front these stories I'm not sure if it's as compelling as the people who actually get the stories. They may not look as good, perhaps, but I don't think it matters. I think that the authenticity of seeing people, especially in broadcast media, in seeing people who really own the stories and have the stories, and they don't have to present them you know, with track sound, track sound, track sound, but they can present them in a different way. 
I mean, when we do our TV show, and I'm not like I'm not trying to use that as the shining example, but we never look at the camera. I mean, we just have a meeting. And they're real meetings. They're authentic meetings. And they're funny, but they're real. But I don't think they have to be funny either. I mean, I think you could have, there are ways of presenting things that can be fundamentally different and fresh that can convey the same information, maybe in a more compelling way, in a more current way, in a fresher way that may attract an audience that is kind of left because they're bored. And I think that in some ways broadcast doesn't understand the problem as much as print. Mm -hmm. uh, you've talked uh, publicly about <coughs> being gay and how difficult it was to keep that a secret until you didn't any longer. Could you talk about those pressures and how liberating it must have felt now that you can talk openly about it and what is the environment in your industry and in our industry about it? viewing an issue like that, or is it even an issue? Anymore? Well, I mean, I was agoraphobic for a long time. Um, I just freaked out um, when I went on television um, because, I mean, I just thought, this is the career ender. So my solution was just, you know, if I'm not working, never leave the house. And um, I lived that way for three years um, where I literally, I, I just was panicked when I would go out. And it was a panic that was this kind of irrational panic that made no sense. It had just kind of fed on itself. And finally, one day, I just thought to myself, I am ruining my life. You know, this is great. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a, sh you know, I had a show at the time on this, uh, the station where I also was a reporter. And I thought, I'm miserable. This is just awful. And it's just, you know, and it's not like I want to make a declaration to anybody, but it's like, you know, if the news director really hates it, screw him, I'll just do something else. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. And I just, it was kind of, you read the tipping point? Um, it was kind of, the, the, there, there was a tipping point for me. And I just thought to myself, that's it. And it just, it was just one day. And then um, nothing happened. <laughs> you know, nothing happened, it was the same. And, um, <laughs> And then I realized, God, I can't believe, and, and, and I sometimes do this, I build things up in my head, and I can create scenarios. And I, you know, I create nuclear war in my head when it's not that at all. It's one of my many flaws. And, um, and I think I did that with that. And it was nothing. That said, I do think there are areas in the country where it is a huge problem still. And I think that it's a liability in terms of career um, for people who come out and for people, and, and, and I think there is still a lack of, of tolerance. Um, and I think that there is a long way to go. Um, I've been pretty lucky. There were all kinds of rumors, maybe it was more than rumor there for a while, that TMZ was going to have a presence in Washington that was going to be substantial. Whatever happened with that? Um, it's going to happen someday. <laughs> um, I, it's my passion. Um, I want to do TMZ DC more than anything. And, and the only thing stopping us right now is we just have so much going on um, back in LA, um, you know, between the website and the TV show and, uh, you know, mobile and this TMZ Live thing that we're working on. And we've, we've launched a Hollywood, TMZ Hollywood bus tour. And, <laughs> which, by the way, is so much fun. If you ever come to LA, it is so much fun. It's a show. Um, but um, there are so many things we're doing that it, it, I realized it will require me to be here for a while. And I want to do that. And I'm going to do that. And the reason I want to do it is because um, I really believe that so much of the media that covers politics is really covering it for inside the Beltway. And that there are millions of people out there who want to like politics, want to be interested, and they feel badly that they're not, but it's not accessible to them, it's boring to them, it's too complicated for them, and they can't find an entry level. And what I want to do is I want to make TMZ DC a personality-based site, not because it's going to be the most important material, but it's going to introduce people to politics on a level that they can relate to, on a personality level. And I'll tell you quickly, we did this with Aaron Schock. And, um, we did it with Aaron Schock in a funny sort of way, and I think, I don't know if you guys follow this at all, but we, you know, we, the joke was we were going to make him the Brody Jenner of Washington, D.C. And we found him um, out walking to a boat and interviewed him, and in fact, I think the cameraman, is Colin here? 
I think, Colin, you were the cameraman who did that. And um, his, his press secretary called me up and said, how dare you, you can't do this, this isn't the way Hollywood, it's not Hollywood. And, and I said, you're gonna call me up in a few days and apologize. And we got, we got this video on CNN and Fox News and the NBC station in Chicago and Peoria, where he's from. And the bottom line to this is, we did a series of stories about Aaron Schock that were personality driven. And um, I went to dinner with him not too long ago. And he said, before you, we go, let's you know, come to my office because I'm doing this telephonic town hall. And they usually get like, I don't know, like 50 to 100 people in this thing. They have, he had like 12,000 people on the phone. And it's because, and he, and he will be very open about this. He, he talks about this. He said, TMZ did more for me to get people interested in who I am. And now I can talk about what I'm interested in. And they'll actually listen. And I think that there is a way of getting a lot of people involved in politics on that personality level. And then we'll do other things. But I re that's what I want to do. And we're going to eventually do it. You want to give us a timeline on that at all? <laughs> you know, I, I, I could die first. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, there's, just, there's a lot of pressure right now to just with all the things that are going on in L.A. And, I, and, and you know, the, the, the problem with any business is if you try and do too much, things can fall apart. We and know that, but what about next year? What, no. What happen next year? We're going to do, okay. we're going to do politics next year. Okay. I just don't know that we're going to be able to do TMZ DC as a formal site. Okay, very good. Well, if you can just stand by for a second, I'm going to make some last announcements and then we'll get to the last question and our uh, a little uh, presentation here. We are almost out of time. A couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you all about some upcoming speakers, the first of which it's too late to buy a ticket, and that's October 31st. Herman Cain will be here in the ballroom. November 3rd, Tom Brokaw is going to be here to talk about the political scene, as well as a new book he has out. November 22nd, uh, the U.S. Postmaster General Patrick Donahue will be here to talk about uh, the troubles that are affecting his organization and the solutions that they would like to try to enact. Now, Harvey, if you could come here. Uh, we always give a uh, parting gift, and believe it or not, this gift we're going to give you today is a first of its kind because we're aware of the sort of branding that you have on your TV show. <laughs> Typically, we give a coffee mug, but we're aware that you don't use a coffee I know mug. What this is. It is a <laughs> National Press Club travel mug. So that's for you, and then we'll have one more question for you. I'm going to use this on the show. I'm going to use this on the show. We think it would be a great launching point for your next, uh, you know, D.C.-based publication or website. Have the National Press Club I love logo this. there. Thank you. No, but so thank you. We're we're glad to have you here today, Harvey. It's been an uh, interesting uh, question and answer period, as well as your speech. Um, we're going to ask a final question, and that is: Is there one particular celebrity from the past that you would have liked to have covered or gotten to know yourself? But either currently alive or from the past, that you're like, that is the, you know, top of the heap celeb that I would have liked to have had an opportunity to get to know. Yeah, I mean, the, the person that I wish I would have gotten to know and the person I wish I could have done something with in the site is Steve Jobs. I mean, I think Steve Jobs is one, it, it may be the most influential person in our lifetime. Uh, and he blows me away. I mean, I, I cannot believe his vision. I think he is, he, he, he is an historic figure. Um, what he did is he changed everything about our world. Um, as profoundly as the airplane did, um, he changed everything about our world. And it wasn't just one thing that he did. He did thing after thing after thing. And I, I just have never read about anybody or seen anything with anybody that with that kind of vision in our lifetime. I, I just think he was a remarkable. I cannot wait for this book. I cannot wait for this book to come out. So that's my feeling. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for our guest speaker today, Harvey? Thanks so much. For thank, you much. thank you. I'd like to thank our National Press Club staff, including our Library and Broadcast Center, for organizing today's event. And if you want more information about the club, or if you'd like a copy of today's program, please check out our website, www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. Nice to have you. Nice to have you. with the seemingly minor auto accident on Thanksgiving. TMZ said the initial public account of Tiger's run-in with a neighbor's tree didn't make any sense, and they were right. <laughs>
By the time it was all over, the golf legend was divorced from his wife and from many of his sponsors, and he's no longer the world's number one golfer. These kinds of events transcend celebrity gossip. They flow into business and political issues. TMZ has grown from a celebrity video-centric website to a live web stream program, a TV show that's syndicated daily by Fox Broadcasting, and as of this summer, a radio program on satellite radio. TMZ has played, uh, rather has broken ground in the way that news is packaged with an emphasis on speed. Last year, a study by the New York Times named TMZ the 10th most popular news site, measured by Google News and Google Blog Hits. And according to Alexa, the website rankings concern, TMZ ranks above CBSNews.com, Bloomberg.com, Politico, and NPR. Our guest has had a fascinating journey which continues to unfold, and we're thankful that it brought him here today. He graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, and this may be her last luncheon here today, and we're so thankful for all the wonderful work that you've done here this year. We'll skip over the speaker for just a moment. Alicia Mundy is with the Wall Street Journal, and she's a member of the Speakers Committee and a co-organizer of today's event. Thank you for all of that. Jim Paratori is executive producer with TMZ.com and a guest of the speaker. Nice to have you here today as well, Jim. Richard Simon is a reporter with the Los Angeles Times. Rick Dunham, this is a long list of titles here. He's a former NPC president. He is the Washington bureau chief with the Houston Chronicle and Hearst. And he is also the president of our National Press Club Journalism Institute, of which the Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library is the crown jewel. <laughs> Garrett Graff is a new member of the club. He is editor of the Washingtonian Magazine. Garrett, nice to have you here, and thank you for your membership. And at the end of the table, Christopher Chambers is professional professor of journalism at Georgetown University, an all-round good guy. Good to have you here as well. Please give them a round of applause. Well, those of us who are in the trade know that no good reporter, and maybe even some bad ones, no good reporter likes to be scooped. We really don't like it when we're beaten by an internet site that focuses on the both at once. <laughs> good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick with the Associated Press. I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while working to foster a free press around the world. For more information about the National Press Club, we'd invite you to look at our website. That's at www.press.org. And to donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library, you can look at the website there. That's part of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker, as well as all of those of you who are attending today's event here in the ballroom. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, this is my reminder during this political season for each and every luncheon that we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity when you hear that applause. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also for the literary and grimy entertainment industry. But in the summer of 2009, a lot of people were beaten on the story. In fact, everybody was. A story about the death of pop idol Michael Jackson. As we all know, the aftermath of that story continues to unfold in a California courtroom where Jackson's doctor is being tried for involuntary manslaughter. TMZ's stock was celebrity gossip, but its founder, Harvey Levin, knew that the Michael Jackson story, like so many other events in the entertainment world, had become part of our nation's culture as well as a reflection of it. That success of his venture is proof that Americans th want their Lindsay Lohan and J-Lo fixes as well. Our guests figured out a better way to deliver that. TMZ.com was launched in 2005 and within seven months became the number one entertainment news site in the world. In 2007, Newsweek called TMZ the breakout blog. And the New York Times is called Harvey the man who may represent the future of celebrity journalism. TMZ claims to be the first operation to have broken such celebrity stories as Mel Gibson's wild anti-Semitic tirade after his DUI arrest, the John Edwards sex scandal, which of course had uh, huge repercussions throughout the world of politics, 
and the details of Tiger Woods' downfall that began featured in our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available for free download on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag PoundNPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A as we always do, and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. And now it's time to introduce our head table. Please note that a journalist's presence at the head table uh, does not imply or signify an endorsement of any speaker. Uh, I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. And we'll begin from your right, Noel St. John. He's a freelance photojournalist and coordinator of our member volunteer photographers here at the club. Thank you for all that, Noel. Matt Small, he's one of my colleagues at Associated Press Radio, a radio producer there. We know him as the Beast. It's good to have him here at the head table. Myron Belkind is an adjunct professor at the George Washington School of Media and Public Affairs and our NPC treasurer. April Ryan is Washington Bureau Chief and White House Correspondent with American Urban Radio Network. Andy Sporkin is a Vice President for Communications with the Association of American Publishers and a guest of our speaker. Nice to have you here today, Andy. Skip over the podium for just a moment. Melissa Charbonneau with Newshook Media, our Speakers Committee Chair.